happy also that my parents are here. Amen. That was a blessing. I can sneak over from the valley. We have been looking at that book of Psalms, and we spent a couple of weeks in Psalms 23. And uh, still, still that, that Psalms is, there is so much in it that we didn't cover, and I just hope that you, in your private study, in your private time, still, still take more out of Psalms 23. But the main thing that I hope you took from Psalms 23 is that the Lord is your shepherd. And He is your shepherd, you are His sheep. And sheep follow the shepherd. Thank you. 
it begins by saying, He dwells in the secret place of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. We're going to, we're going to look at two things. What is the secret place of the Most High? Why is that important? Because the Bible promises, He, whoever dwells there, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. If we are under the shadow of God, God is above us, under his care. There's no other place I'd rather be. Amen, friends? Amen. So we're going to look at what is that secret place of the Most High and what does it mean to dwell there? What does it mean to, to, to dwell there? So I want you to turn your Bible to Ezekiel chapter 7. Ezekiel chapter 7. And this is the whole context of Ezekiel, we're going to look at verses 20. But meanwhile, you're looking for Ezekiel chapter 7. The context of Ezekiel chapter 7 is God's judgment on Israel. God's judgment on Israel because Israel has, has in many times, apostatized, been disobedient, and I invite you to read chapter 7 at home, and so many times God is, you, you can see it, that God is fed up. And so, so here is God's judgment on Israel, and especially on the temple. Here in verse 20, Ezekiel 7, verse 20, the Bible says, As for the beauty of his ornaments, he set it in majesty. But they made from it the images. to behold the beauty 
of the Lord and to inquire in his what? Temple. So the house of the Lord is his temple, his protection. And notice verse 5. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon the rock. So here, what is the secret place of the Almighty? It's the temple of the Lord. David found refuge in the temple of the Lord, in the presence of God. And here he says, He will hide me in his secret place of his tabernacle. And the tabernacle was the sanctuary temple. The, the sanctuary temple. And so David's desire is to dwell there all the days of his life. You see, in the Old Testament, in the wilderness, the secret place, there was the sanctuary. A, a portable, a portable version of the temple where God literally dwelt. Where God literally dwelt. God doesn't dwell anymore in a temple today. And we know this because of Matthew 27, verse 51, when Jesus died on the cross there in Matthew 27, the Bible says that the veil in the temple ripped from top to bottom, indicating that the temple services were no longer necessary, the temple of God was no longer in there, because Jesus was here on earth. And so, and so, if, if God did not, did not dwell in an earthly temple, where then does God dwell? In a heavenly temple. And if you join me there in Hebrews chapter 8, Hebrews chapter 8, we're going to, we're going, we're going to see that, just to see that the secret place of the Almighty is the temple. There in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, the Bible says, and now this is the main point of the things which we are saying. <clears throat> we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. The true sanctuary that who made? God did and not man. So this isn't, this, this isn't a sanctuary or a temple made by man, made by Moses or Solomon or Herod. This is one that God made, and it says there that it is in heaven. If we go to Psalms 102, Psalms 102, we see there another reference of David telling us that God is in his holy temple in heaven. Psalm 102, verse 19. Don't, don't move your place in Hebrews. Psalm 102, verse 19 says, For he, is talking about God, for he looked down from the heights of his sanctuary. From heaven the Lord viewed the earth. So is there a sanctuary in heaven? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So from Hebrews, if, if, if we go back to Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 and 12, we even see more specific. There it says, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made by with hands, that is, not of this creation. Of the sanctuary in heaven. And verse 12 says, Not with the blood of goats and cattle, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place, once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. You see, in the earthly sanctuary, in the earthly temple, blood was always spilled by goats, by sheep, by bulls, by calves. But here it says, Not with the blood of goats, but with whose blood? With his own blood, Jesus being the Lamb of God, was crucified for you and for me. And here it says, he entered the most holy place. The most holy place. Christ is in the heavenly sanctuary. And more specific, we know that he is in the most holy place. He is in the most holy place. So if Jesus is in the most holy place, and and the secret place of the Most High is the temple. There is no 
Jesus is there, and more specific, in the most holy place. <coughs> what do we find in the most holy place? For those who are familiar with, with the sanctuary and, and uh, how it's laid out, you had a holy place, you, you had a courtyard, and then you had two compartments, which were the holy place and the most holy place. This is basic information for any Seventh-day Adventist. And so, so Jesus is in the most holy place where inside you find the Ark of the Covenant. Is that right? Yeah. Amen. The Ark of the Covenant. May I suggest that in the most holy place you find the distinctive doctrine of Seventh-day Adventist. In the most holy place you find the distinctive doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So in the Ark of the Covenant, what, what is the Ark of the Covenant? The Ten Commandments, right? The tablet of stone written with the finger of God. Amen. As Seventh day Adventists, we believe that the law of God was not nailed to the cross, but it is still valid and true for every Christian to follow. Every Christian to follow. There in Ecclesiastes 4, verse 13, it says, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. Fear God and keep his commandments. John 15, verse 10, Jesus said, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And even, Je and even Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. So the commandments are still, are still valid today. If it wasn't for the commandments, who wouldn't know what sin is? And that's what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 3, verse 20. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. By the law, I know that, that I shouldn't have any other God, but just have God as my only true God. By the law, I, I know that I shouldn't commit adultery, not just physically, but even mentally. I shouldn't covet of what other people have. I shouldn't steal. By the law of God, I know what sin is. What sin is. But we are not saved by the law, friends. We are saved by Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's why, that's why also in the law, we have the fourth commandment that tells us, remember the seventh day to keep it holy. Six days you shall work and do all that work, but the seventh day is of the Sabbath of the Lord your God. And the Sabbath, as Jesus says, was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And if you join me in Isaiah chapter 66, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 66, the Sabbath has been kept from creation. All through the Old Testament, all through the New Testament, even New Testament believers, after the resurrection of Christ, the Sabbath has, has been kept and has been kept throughout history. And is the Sabbath still being kept today? Amen. We're here. There in Isaiah chapter 66, verses 22 and 23, it will be kept forever. It says, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, said the Lord. So shall your descendants and your name and your name remain, and it shall come to pass that from one, one new moon to another, from one month to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. All flesh shall come and worship before me, says the Lord. Sorry. So in the Ark of the Covenant, we find the law of God, which we believe that is still valid. God still wants His children to be commandment keepers. And in those commandments we have the Sabbath. A distinctive doctrine of Seventh-day Adventist, which we believe is, is, is very important, especially uh, as the last days come closer. But the law of God does not save us. It tells us that I am a sinner and I am in need of a Savior. You see, when I look at the law, I see how dirty I am. I see the filth that I am. The, the things that I covet. The things that are hard in my mind. Sometimes I may put other things in front of God. And so, so I can't go to the law to find forgiveness. No, I go to Jesus. That's why in Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3 verse 24, here Paul tells us, Therefore the law was, a, was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. The law brings us to Christ. Again, one of our distinct doctrines is that not the law saves us, but Jesus Christ saves us. We 
we obey the law because we love Jesus. That's what he says. If you love me, you keep my commandments. If you love him. And so because we love him, and the law brings us closer to him, Jesus Christ is our salvation. Is our salvation. Now, in the Hebrew sanctuary in the Old Testament, when the high priest would go into the most holy place, what was his work there to do? What would he do there? It was the work of what? The work of cleansing. The work of judgment. God was, was judging all of Israel in that day known as the Day of Atonement. In the Day of Atonement. If we turn to James chapter 2, you see, the law is so important because by the law, we are judged. That's why we can't get rid of the law. Because by the law, we know that we are sinners. And by the law, we are also judged. James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Verse 
my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. So when he comes, he is going to give them the reward. Now, does the judge give the reward before he judges or after he has already judged? Yeah. After. After the judge has viewed the evidence and listened to all the, the pros and cons and then he made judgment, then if the reward is freedom, that's the reward. If your reward is time in jail, that's the reward. But if the reward comes after the judge has, has done his work. So there we can see that judgment is before he comes. So if judgment is before he comes, this is important. No one can go to heaven before he comes because they haven't been judged yet. Is it making sense? No one can sneak into heaven before he comes because he's still doing the work of judging. And until he comes, he gives everyone their reward as we saw there in Revelation. And the reward will be everlasting life or, or everlasting death. So therefore the dead don't go to heaven or don't go to hell. According to 1 Thessalonians, if you turn with me there, 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14. A very well-known text. It says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep already on, on, on what Jesus refers to those who have died, those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. Don't miss that. It's not by, by what I say. It's by what God says. It's by the word of the Lord. Even Paul says, it's not by my word, but by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel, and with a trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So obviously the dead in Christ are not anywhere near heaven or hell. But they are sleeping in the arms of Christ. They're, they are in a sleep mode waiting for what? For the trumpet of God, for the archangel, for the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise First, then, notice verse 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, and the word there is, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So then, those who are dead in Christ, that means you have died, believing, putting your faith in Jesus, and you have died before He comes. When He comes, then, Bible says, not before, but then you will raise up first and with those who remain alive together, we're going to meet the Lord in the air. No one's going to meet the Lord before us or before those who are um, alive when He comes. Together we'll meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Amen. So in the most holy place we find our distinctive doctrine there. We find the law of God, which is still valid. We find the Sabbath, which is still valid. We find salvation only through Jesus Christ. We find judgment. We find the state of the dead, because if judgment hasn't happened, then no one can go to heaven. The state of the dead, we find the message there. And there are other doctrines we find in the sanctuary, in the most holy place that I'm not covering right now. We find the health message. Because in the Ark of the Covenant, there was a bowl of manna. <clears throat> we find the spirit of prophecy in the, in the Ark, in the most holy place. Because when judgment began, according to Daniel 8 and Daniel 9, which was 1844, God gave the spirit of prophecy in 1844. So what does it mean to dwell in the secret place of the most high? In the secret place of the is a temple. And there's no earthly temple here now that we're looking at, but it points us to the heavenly temple. And we look at Jesus is in the most holy place, and we see our distinctive doctrines there. What does it mean then to dwell in the most, 
to dwell in the secret place of the Most High. According to the American, American Heritage Dictionary, the word well means to live in, to live in, to recite, <laughs> not, not to It talks about being present somewhere. When, when the Bible says that Abraham dwelt in Egypt, he didn't visit it. He literally lived in Egypt there for a time. When the Bible says there in Exodus 25 verse 8 where God says, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. God literally was there. Not symbolically. He literally was there in the Hebrew sanctuary. Sometimes this is known as the Shekinah of glory that covers over the Ark of the Covenant. And nobody could go in because God's presence was literally there. To dwell means to, to be there. And if you come with me to 1 Peter chapter 3, here Peter gives us uh, an, an example. Just, just how a husband and a wife they dwell together, don't they? They live together. They are always in the presence of each other. When you are married, you dwell with your spouse. That's what the Bible says that, you know, you should leave father and mother. Why? Because now you're going to dwell, to live, to live with your husband or to live with your wife. There in 1 Peter chapter 3. Now, most of us men, we like chapter uh, uh, verse 1. Wives, likewise, submit to your husband. <laughs> and although some may call it male chauvinist friend, it's a biblical message. Wives should submit to their husbands. But verse 7 is what we forget as men. Verse 7 says, Husbands, likewise, like what? Likewise, what does that mean? Like what? Reading a little bit of the context, like the wives, Submit to the husband, husbands likewise. So we don't we don't get a, we don't get away. God's telling us, husbands, you likewise. Like you want the wives to be to you, you be to your wives also. Husbands likewise, and then it says dwell. Dwell with them. With what? Understand. Amen. Those those men who are married know that we need understanding to dwell with our wives. Amen. 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 It's not easy, but God has asked us to have understanding. Be patient. God purposely made us different. Dwell with them with understanding. And then it says, giving honor to the wife. Giving honor to the wife. So as we dwell, as as Peter here is, is, is using the word well, that a spouse, they are constantly together. And here, he's giving the husbands, you know, a, a little more tug that we need to be more understanding with the wives. We need to honor them. Honor them. That's a whole message in itself. If we are honoring our wives. So here, Peter is telling us, as an example of dwelling is to be together, to live together, to reside together. Now, if in the most holy place our distinctive doctrines are there, are we dwelling there? As Seventh-day Adventists, do we dwell in, in present truth? Do we dwell in present truth? Do we dwell in the distinctive doctrines of the church? Do we believe that we are living in judgment time right now? Amen. And strive to live a holy life. That's the message of judgment. It's not just, oh, okay, we're in judgment. It's that we begin to ask God to purify and refine our hearts and to help us live a holy life. And not that we just come every Sabbath and just punch the clock. But that we strive to live every day a holy life because we are living in judgment hour, in judgment time. If you, if you have ever been in front of a judge, which I have, you are nervous. And you put on the best smile, the nicest clothes, right? Why? Because you're in judgment. Even though you may be innocent and you may not have been speeding, you're still in front of the judge. You're still in front of the judge. And so as we are living in judgment time right now, how are we living? Do we believe and still dwell in our distinctive darkness? Do we believe that the Sabbath, 
the biblical message, the biblical messages of our church are hardly He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. The secret place is the temple of God. There is no earthly temple here. There is only a heavenly temple. And we follow Jesus wherever He goes. He is in the most holy place. And I want to dwell with Him. And in the most holy place we find our distinctive doctrines there. Are we dwelling in our darkness. Amen. And I would appeal to you, brothers and sisters, not only to hold up our darkness, but to live them every day. Amen. To live them every day. You see, there was a time, there was a time where, you, where people could recognize the Seventh-day Adventists. There was a time where people were stuck, where Seventh-day Adventists stuck out. But slowly and surely they have been blending in with the world. Now you can't even tell if there's a seven day event or not. But praise the Lord, there is still a remnant group. There is still a remnant group that dwells in the Most High, that dwells in the presence of God, that dwells in the distinctive doctrines and holds up this present truth. Why do we dwell in the present truth? Because that's where Jesus presently is. He is in the Most Holy Place. He is presently there, so we need to hold up this present truth every day of our lives as well. And I just appeal to you, brothers and sisters, that we dwell there not just here on Sabbath, not just today. The Bible doesn't say there in Psalm 91, He who visits the secret place of the Most High, but He who dwells, dwells, living there, just how we dwell with our spouse, just how we dwell in the city that we live in, we dwell in our home. Does our doctrine, do we believe, do, do what we believe at 7 p.m., do we dwell in that? Ask yourself those questions. And I just want to appeal for the visitors and for our members. Maybe this has been something new. I appeal to you to turn to Colossians chapter 3. This is our closing text. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. You see, sometimes I hear that we need to preach Jesus and not our doctrine. Our distinctive doctrines are separate from Jesus. Friends, I beg to differ. Jesus is all over our doctrines. If you think that they're different, you need to get to know Jesus again. Here in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Let the word of Christ dwell. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom. The doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church are filled with the grace and love of Jesus. Every single one. Every single one. If you think they are different, I appeal to you to study them again and get to know Jesus through the spirit of prophecy. Get to know Jesus through the state of the dead. Get to know Jesus through the judgment message. Get to know Jesus through the Sabbath. Get to know Jesus through every single doctrine that we have. Then in verse 17 says, And whatever you do in words or deeds, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father through Him. So church, I just appeal to you, as Seventh-day Adventists, we have a truth that is more valuable 